Okay. Do you want to say hello? Hello to the people? Okay. So that was Gabriel, my three, almost three month old son. That is still so weird to say that, that I have a son. That feels very, very grown up. I am sitting down today and I'm going to do my birth story. I asked if you wanted to hear it and many of you said yes, please. Um, I know these videos are really useful. I didn't actually watch any YouTube birth stories before I had Gabriel, but I did speak to friends of mine in real life about their birth stories. And as I got closer to giving birth, whereas when I first found out I was pregnant, I, had, I did not want to hear any birth stories. As I got closer to it, I did want to hear them because I feel like it just helps to prepare you for things that might happen. If I hadn't have started talking to women about their birth stories, I wouldn't have known what an episiotomy was. Um, I wouldn't have known what pethidin was. I wouldn't have known loads of things. So it is really useful to start talking about these things as you get closer to birth. Let's just get straight into it. I've, I already feel a bit all over the place. My birth story. <laughs> um, how do I even start this? Everyone told, t said to me afterwards, you had a very traumatic delivery. I don't think of it as traumatic, but everyone told me afterwards it was. And I basically experienced every single type of birth that one could experience. First things first, Gabriel came about two and a half, basically three weeks early. He's my first pregnancy, and I think everyone that's been pregnant can relate to that being a very big surprise to have an early first baby because all you ever hear when you are pregnant is, or when you're going to have your first baby, is that they will probably come late. Oh, it'll be about two weeks late. So I really was prepared for him to come mid-September. He was due the beginning of September. I was really prepared for him to come around like the 11th or 12th, I thought, loads of time. And yeah, that didn't happen. He came almost three weeks early. So <laughs> I hadn't packed my hospital bag. I would packed his hospital bag. Um, I hadn't packed mine. I hadn't put the cot up we didn't have a car seat like there was just so many things that hadn't been done and the week he came was the week I was going to get everything sorted and coincidentally the week he came was also well the day he came was the day I was supposed to have my 37 week midwife appointment um, and talk about my birth plan <laughs> so there we go and I guess that's where I'll start birth plans birth preferences I really think they should be called birth preferences I didn't really have a plan. I really wasn't that bothered about how it happened as long as he was delivered safely and with as little trauma to myself as possible. My whole view on birth is that it isn't really about the mother. That might seem harsh. I just I just felt like it wasn't about me. It's about the safest way to get this baby out. The li as little trauma to me as possible, please. The mother is important, but ultimately I'm not a medical professional. I don't know the best way to get this baby out. So for me to try and plan it, in my head, just it, there's no point. Definitely, and this is why I think maybe they should change it to birth preferences rather than a birth plan, definitely have some say over things that you would like or options that you have. But I think that's more what it's about, you knowing and being confident in the options that you have should anything happen. Because as I know, things can take a turn as you will find out and I think all this emphasis on like a natural birth and a water birth and everything it's lovely and I completely understand why people want that for their experience however I do think it can undermine the access that we have to medical care and the importance of that access because not to scare anyone um, and it's definitely not something to focus on but ultimately childbirth as natural as it is is actually well, can be very, very dangerous. We need these interventions and if we didn't have them, well, basically before we had access to these things, a lot of women and babies didn't make it. So again, not to worry anyone, but that is the reality of childbirth. As natural as it is, it can also be very dangerous. And so I think I just, knowing a lot of people that have had babies around me, I was just very realistic about that. Again, I, you, you can say, I would like for this to happen and I, encourage you to do that but I think it's more just about being aware of things because I think for me that was the biggest thing I don't know why my midwife waited all this time to do a birth plan 
I feel like maybe as soon as you hit 30 weeks, you should start talking about the birth because there was just other things that I wasn't aware of, like the vitamin K injection. As soon as they're born, they ask you if they want, if you want a vitamin K injection. And I just had no clue what that was. So I was like, is that what people do? And they suggest, I was like, well, yeah, okay. And then it turns out Gabriel actually had tongue tie and had he not had the vitamin K injection, he wouldn't have been able to have the tongue tie procedure. I had no idea about any of these things. Um, delayed cord clamping, just all this stuff. I had no idea about so when it came to it and it came early i was underprepared so i do i feel like you just need to go through all of those things anyway i've talked about birth plans way too way too much but but yeah i didn't really have a plan i all i knew was that i've not never done this before i want access to pay relief if, if i need it that was really the preference and i mean i didn't really want to have to be induced and i didn't really want a c-section i suppose they were my three preferences Access to pain relief, no C-section, no induction. So, how did it all start? I go to bed on a Monday night. Don't expect anything. Actually, I'm gonna say at the end, I had had warning signs, but I didn't realize there were warning signs. Anyway, so I go to bed. I then wake up at about 12.30, like midnight, half past 12 in the, in, in the night, needing the toilet. <laughs> so I sit up out of bed. As I go to get out of bed, I feel a gush. Not a gush like you see in the in the movies, but just like a, it was like um I don't know maybe you'd spilt like half a glass of water maybe not even that, and even then it didn't twig. I just suddenly was like, hmm, I've never not been able to hold a wee before. That's weird. So I go to the loo and it becomes pretty obvious to me that that was my water's breaking because it it doesn't feel like a wee. <laughs> it comes from the middle, so it feels and it feels wider than a wee if that makes sense. It doesn't feel as targeted as a wee. Um, and it comes from the middle of you. So it's definitely, you can't confuse it with a wee. I think because I'd just woken up, I was like, what the hell? Anyway, go to the loo. And so I ring triage, which is the place in the maternity unit where they kind of screen you. And it, basically triage, I, you can ring. Well, I'm not sure how it is for everyone else, but my hospital and I think in the UK, you can basically ring triage 24 hours a day if there's any problems. And then as soon as you go into labour, you ring them um, and kind of tell them what's going on. So I rang them and I said, so, um, I went to the loo, this, ha this happened, and they said, yeah, it sounds like your waters are broken. How many weeks do you eat? 37. Wear a pad, they say, and call us back in about half an hour and tell us what colour it is. So if, for anyone whose waters haven't broken, once they do break, you would have to wear a pad anyway. <laughs> is all I'm going to say, because you're very liquidy, I suppose, we'll, we'll call it. Wear this pad, you basically get like a pinkish tinge to everything. Then that can lead to like a bloody show that you might have heard of, or your mucus plug going. Again, that kind of stuff I'm not really sure about, because I wasn't, I don't, wasn't really told about it. I was by a friend, but not formally. And I think that happened later, but I was too out of it to realise. So they said, okay, come up to the hospital. I wasn't contracting at this point. And I'm not sure why they said to come up to the hospital because they didn't actually do an examination. I thought they would do. And you'll see that they probably should have. So we get to hospital. I show them the pad and they're like, yep, yeah, fine. That's, this is happening. I started contracting at hospital and they were like, oh, it'll probably be, you know, quite a while. So go home, try and get some sleep. If nothing happens in kind of 24 hours, then give us a call back. Okay, fine. So we go home, I start contracting in the Uber on the way home, going over speed bumps. It's awful. Not start, but I continue contracting. What I had done um, was downloaded an app called Freya, I think, where you can track your, track your contractions. Um, that I had done. So we get home. So this is about 2 maybe, 2 a.m. I sit on the side of the bed and I'm already like, do you know what? I can't, I can't sleep through these. No, no, no. Um, and they become kind of intense. So, and... Just to also mention, I mean, everyone says you get this memory loss uh, of, of the pain. I can still remember exactly how painful these contractions were, like they happened yesterday. That still has not gone. So, um, and for me, it was right, it was in my back. It wasn't like in my, it wasn't like a period pain in my stomach. It was my back. And it was just a very oppressive, like pushing down pain. I can't really explain it, but because saying it's a really bad period pain just doesn't do it justice. It's this awful, honestly keeled over, no, nothing is comfortable type pain in your lower back for me. So I sit down on the bed and I start tracking my contractions. 
pretty soon it says it looks like you're in established labor and I was like what the fuck then all of a sudden I get the urge to push <laughs> and it, you just can't not when that happens you've got no control you just feel like your body it and I never did hypnobirthing but your body just pushes it just takes over it's not you doing it your body does it so then I say to Hainsley and this must have been about half three in the morning so from half 12 is when I woke up my waters broke very quick birth this was I was like oh, we're gonna have to call the ambulance because I can't move out of this room without aid so we call the ambulance they get to us actually it may have even been 3 a.m but yeah around that time because we got to hospital at four I didn't realize in all this that was happening so they come and they do to give me a physical examination. I hear them talking over me about whether they've got enough time to get to hospital before this baby's born and I was like, what? And what I didn't know until afterwards that one of them had taken Hainsley aside and said, this is very rare but she's fully dilated. So it was about three hours. Although I think I may have been a bit dilated before this happened because I, I had things happening the week before. Obviously Hainsley was like, what the fuck? Poor Hainsley, I woke him up out of his sleep and he was deep sleeping, like <gasps> saying my waters are broken and then all of a sudden we have to go to hospital and I'm like yelling at him like oh my god can you just get my go into my knicker drawer and get my massive black pants and can you get these pajama bottoms because I'm thinking what do I need I need to go to hospital and we're gonna have a baby I haven't even packed my hospital bag so poor love is running around doing that the hos the ambulance then decides we do have time to get to hospital to wheel me down and again I'm so grateful I was grateful for the whole of the way that my birth went but I'm so grateful that it happened in the middle of the night because I live opposite a very big Sainsbury's in a block of flats. So to be, have been wheeled out basically naked, they covered me obviously, in pain, having contractions, down the lift, out opposite Sainsbury's in broad daylight would have just been, it wouldn't have been awful because I wouldn't have known, but do you know what I mean? I'm just glad that no one was around. So we get wheeled out, never been in an ambulance, didn't have a chance to enjoy it because I didn't know what was going on. Oh, they give me gas and air, which is horrible by the way. Didn't do anything for the pain and it just makes your lips dry and is a really horrible taste in your mouth, but you know, you have it just to breathe through the contractions. Um, so we get to hospital, there's a bit of a faff. And then before I know it, no, I don't remember anyone asking me, but I'm just getting taken into the birthing center and the birthing center is where the birth pool is. So in my head, I'm like, oh my God, this is great. I must be such a natural at having children. My pregnancy was easy. I went into labor like that. And now here I am, I'm gonna have this beautiful natural birth that people dream of. One thing I will say is, like I say, I, w I wasn't bothered about water, but if you do want a natural birth, definitely don't even think about not doing it in water. The water does really help. And as soon as I got into the water, I mean, it's, it's still painful and I don't know how it would feel when, like the baby coming out, but in terms of the contractions, it really helped soothe them. Um, I was quite happy to stay in there for as long as I needed to. I didn't feel like, well, I did feel like this needs to end, but do you know what I mean? It was much more bearable once I was in water. So I go into this birthing center in this pool and I'm just like, oh my God, great. We don't have a playlist or anything. So Hainsey's trying to do his phone to get music on, but it coincidentally wasn't working. So we just had like spa music. One thing I also will say is that the midwives were quite shit. And I feel awful saying that because I know that everyone, everyone else I've spoken to seems to love their midwife at their birth. These midwives didn't seem to give a shit. Like the one in the birthing center just was quite mute. She didn't barely, she barely spoke to me. And as we went on, they didn't really speak to us. So we get in there, we're pushing away. Basically, I'm in there for two hours and nothing's happening. So I then have to go up to the ward. You have to try and go to the loo as well before you get in the pool, because if you have a full bladder, it can block the baby coming out. I couldn't go for a wee. Um, so, and this is another thing, the amount of things I got asked to do whilst having a contraction was just quite unreasonable, to be honest. So the midwife says, right, get out of the pool. I'm gonna drain your bladder and check you like physically examine you whilst you're having a contraction. Brilliant, that's fabulous. Oh, and can you lie on your back? Because lying on your back is the most uncomfortable position to be in when you're in labor. Whatever these films say, no, absolutely not. You just want to be on all fours basically, or like leaning over something. But even that gets, un like nothing's comfortable really. But when you lie down on your back, it really feels like you shouldn't be lying on your back. And when you're heavily pregnant, you get told not to lie on your back. So when you're in labor, it just feels really wrong. And it almost feels like you're, gonna break your back it's really it's not it's not that it's just uncomfortable it feels wrong it doesn't feel like you should be on your back so when they say to you oh just lie on your back you're like are you joking do I have to 
Anyway, right, so can't see the head, nothing's progressing, got to take you to the ward, brilliant. Get on this really rock hard wheelchair as well, whilst you're having a contraction, and we'll wheel you up there. So we get into this ward and we're on, well, we're in a, in a delivery room, I assume. I can't really remember, but I assume that's where we were. Two midwives in there, again, barely spoke to me. Um, didn't even really tell me what was going on. Definitely weren't cheering me on, telling me how well I was doing, and that's all I wanted. So it's just Paul Hainsley with me, whilst I'm like, ooh, every two minutes or whatever it was. And then I'm not really sure what happened. So this must have been about 6 a.m. because I was in the birthing center for two hours. A lot of faffing for a while. Then some doctors come in and say to me, hello there, Mary. <laughs> like they're all really sweet and really lovely. But when you're in labor, I was just like, just tell me what you're gonna do and do it. I had no time for pleasantries, but hello there, Mary, how are you? I'm Dr. Stevens or whatever. So, right, and I couldn't tell you what they said to me. But I know I had to sign a consent form. God knows what I was signing. All I hear them say is, we're going to get you some pain relief. So I'm like, that's all I hear. And I'm like, yes. Because like I say, unless you're in water, don't even attempt. Well, I mean, you do you, babe. But the thing about pain relief is it's not just, it's not pain relief. To me, it's, it's just relief. So when you, and I mean, like I say, my labour was very quick. For people that are in labour for days on end, it's just when you're, at that point, you just want it to end and you're so tired, that's what pain relief does. It just gives you relief. So if you're in a long labor, you'll be able to sleep. Because you need to remember <laughs> that labor doesn't end after the baby's here. You have to go home and then look after that baby. So if you're already exhausted from a long, painful labor, and then breastfeeding starts going wrong, like it's just, or if there's something wrong with your baby, which coincidentally there was with Gabe for the first week, if you have to go back to hospital, if you're not strong mentally because you're so exhausted, that time with the baby after they're born could be really compromised. So that's just my thing with pain relief. It just enables you to get some rest. And I just felt like I was in the room as soon as I got it. I was like, okay, I can focus. I feel like I'm here. I'm not missing anything. Whereas, okay, we're back. Sorry, my memory card just ran out of space because obviously I'm talking for way too long. Anyway, um, yeah, pain relief. It, it just made me feel present. Like I could experience this, like I knew what was going on. When I was in pain, I didn't have a fucking clue. So that is my word on pain relief. It, yeah, just cut yourself some slack. Do you know what I mean? Like, if you need to rest, take the pain relief. Um, so anyway, that's all I hear. We're gonna get you pain relief. Brilliant, bring it on. And the reason they said they were gonna give me pain relief is because they, um, and again, there are some details with my birth that I'm not 100% sure about. And this is where I really feel like not to be critical, but I do feel like there was, there's a few things that I wish they would do afterwards. I wish afterwards like a doctor had come round and spoken to me and explained what had happened and why, and made sure that I really understood what had happened and why, um, because no one did that. They came around to check if I was okay, but no one said, okay, so this is what we did and this was why we had to do it. And also I did find out m more what, because I thought he was delivered one way, it was actually a different way. I didn't find that out until my six week checkup. And that's because the hospital gives your doctor a discharge letter, but you don't get this discharge letter. And I just feel like I wish they could send that out because then at least you'd have a copy of it. And again, you'd know what happened. It's only like a top line view of your birth, but at least you'd have an idea. Anyway, so I thought they were just giving me pain relief because they were going to do forceps. Um, and they were like, you know, you, you won't be able to not have pain relief with forceps. It's very painful. Oh, okay, fine. It then turns out, as I spoke to friends afterwards, they were like, well, I didn't, and I had to go into surgery. And I thought everyone had to do this <laughs> that was having forceps. And after speaking to other women, they were like, well, I didn't do that with forceps. And as it turns out, I think they thought they were gonna have to give me a C-section. So my pain relief was in fact a spinal block. And again, I'm not definitely sure what the difference between a spinal block and an epidural is. All I know is that you can only have an epidural up to a certain point um, because I know that women that have wanted an epidural, they've been told, oh, it's too late, it won't work now or something. So I don't know if a spinal block is only done in surgery. I feel like it does and that's why that would make sense as to why you wouldn't be able to have it if you didn't need to go in surgery. Anyway, all I hear is pain relief. Then between them telling me about this pain relief and then it actually happening felt like forever. And I, again, I had to keep asking these mute midwives what was happening. Um, oh yeah, it's coming, it's coming. Okay, anyway, we finally get wheeled in surgery um, and they do this spinal block. And as I say, 
this could potentially be quite a traumatic situation. For me, going into surgery and that experience made the birth because there's about 20 people in there, but they were so lovely and like really looking after me, really cheering me on, telling me how good I was doing. And that's all I wanted <laughs> from these midwives because up until then, no one had been really given a shit that I was there trying to have a baby. It was only Hainsey looking after me that I felt. I just didn't feel very looked after up until that point. And I know that's not nice, you know, I, I'm just being honest. I'm not bashing midwives at all, but the ones that were on duty when I was giving birth just weren't great. And that, that was my experience. I was just really hoping I'd have this lovely midwife that just wouldn't stop talking. Do you know what I mean? But no, they didn't talk. So as soon as I got into surgery, everyone was lovely. And like I say, that just really made the experience. Um, so they do this spinal block. That took a few attempts to get in. I'm not exactly sure why, but again, lying down. Oh, can you sit up whilst having a contraction? Can you lean really forward with a massive pregnant baby bump? and having a contraction, but keep really still because we're jabbing a needle into your spine. Do you know what I mean? It's like, uh, there's a lot demanded from you. <laughs> Anyone that has to have a, a C-section or go into surgery, as I say, just bear in mind that you will be asked to move, to sit really far forward and you've got a bump and it, that's all very difficult. So maybe practice doing that. But anyway, I think that was quite difficult for Hainsley because that was where he couldn't do anything. I was just, you know, taken away, surrounded by needles and medical staff. I think he found that quite difficult, um, as anyone would, because you're just like, oh my god, what the fuck. Anyway, so they do the spinal block. As soon as this started working, I was like, and she's back in the room. I was nice, <laughs> I was chatty, I could hear the radio, um, and I was really happy because I remember go getting wheeled in and hearing Stevie Wonder. What's the song? You can feel it all over, Mr. Duke can't remember the name of that but that song was playing and I felt really happy about it because my mum loves Stevie Wonder and it just made me feel like oh my mum is here do you know what I mean and I felt really happy that he was going to be born possibly to Stevie Wonder I just felt like I'm here guys <laughs> what, what have I missed from having experienced the pain to then having pain relief I mean it's the best thing you'll do for yourself just treat yourself in labour do you know what I mean it's the best thing you'll do so then I'm put onto this bed they're going to operate on well not operate but you know help make me give birth on and it was really funny because it's really it's a really odd sensation to be numb from like the waist down and they said to me oh put your hand on your leg and i could have sworn my legs were just out straight and i look and they're up in these stirrups and i didn't even know when that happened how and then i put my hand on my leg and my obviously my hand could feel my leg but my leg couldn't feel my hand it was so weird then they tell me to push and they're really guts telling me to go for it like yes mary just push just really hard and that was lovely as well because i didn't know when the contraction was coming and that's really weird to be in so much pain and then suddenly not feel it but the, the sensation is still happening not sensation because you can't feel it but that is still happening and not to be able to feel it when you felt it so intensely is so weird but again such a relief because you just have a nurse saying to you oh um okay the contraction's coming now push really hard and that was great um but anyway, I think the reason I had to go into surgery was because they were going to try a force, try forceps, then a ventus, which is like a suck thing. And then if they didn't work, I'd need to have a C-section. So at least if I needed one, I'd be in there. Nothing about this, by the way, felt like an emergency either. It didn't feel rushed. I didn't feel like they were like, shit, we need to get this baby out. It all felt fine and just very par for the course. As I say, the, surger the surgical team were amazing. Um, they were so lovely, again, about five of them. And it was a really nice experience because there was, it was almost like a party. <laughs> I think they tried forceps and then actually he came out with a Ventus because on my discharge letter, as I say at my six week checkup, it said, oh, he was delivered by Ventus. I, for some reason, thought it was forceps. Well, not for some reason, it was because there was the forcep marks on his head. So I don't know if they tried forceps and then had to do a Ventus. I'm assuming that's what happened. But yes, I thought it was forceps up until then. So they didn't have to do a C-section. Great. But I did have to have an episiotomy. And again, I would have had no clue what that was. Um, and it was my friend Carmen um, who told me about her episiotomy, which was fucking awful. Um, but I at least knew what it was and what the aftermath of that might be. Yeah, that's my birth story. I then got taken out of surgery and put into the high dependency unit. I wasn't, I'm not 100% sure why I was on the high dependency unit. I don't know if it's because I had an episiotomy or if because I had a catheter or I'm not really sure, but we were and it was great. You hear all sorts of things, don't you, about going into hospital um, and being on a ward, on a postnatal ward. 
um, but this one was a smaller room, it wasn't a big ward, but there were kind of three other women in there, I think who had all had C-sections, and it's basically, it's high dependency, so a nurse is always there, they're there with you through the night. Um, I couldn't get out of bed because I had a catheter, so they had to pass me the baby, and um, well, Gabriel, um, they come round and wake you whenever, how, like, whenever they need to wake you to feed the baby. Um, well, they didn't even really wake me, they're just squeezing colostrum out my boob for me, putting it into a syringe and giving it to him. Um, burping him for me, changing his nappy, all this stuff. And yeah, I could have stayed there for a week. And my mum says to me, and I'm sure a lot of your mums would say to you, oh, back in the day, you would be in hospital for a week and they just help you look after your baby. And on that ward, I really want, I would have been quite happy for that to happen because all the nurses were just like your mum and it was just really nice to have people like tell you what to do with your baby. <laughs> I was then on there for one night. They then came up the next day, took this thing called a pack out, which is basically a massive tampon. And it's like never ending when they take it out of you. It's like one of those magic hats with like the scarf. It just keeps on coming. That was in there, I think, to stop any bleeding and to, um, what's the word, like clot the episiotomy, I think. Again, I'm not 100% sure. So, yeah. They took the catheter out as well and then I was taken down to a private room which I didn't ask for um I guess it was just available and so then I was in there until 8 p.m that night and I I basically had to not beg to get discharged but I feel like they kind of just forgot about me once I got into this room um so I wished I stayed on the ward and if I was going to stay another night I would have been quite happy to on that ward but in this private room I just felt a bit forgotten about and it was a bit like being in a prison cell like it just was a very dark dingy room and there was no TV in there or anything, it was just quiet. Like, oh, I don't really wanna stay here, I just wanna go home. Um, but, uh, but they're like, you need to do three wees and then we can think about discharging you. They also have to do lots of checks on your baby, which is fine. Um, but yes, the only thing about the high dependency ward was that I did spend the night hearing other women giving birth, which isn't great. Um, but you know, it was in the distance. Um, so there we go that is my birth story i really hope it was useful to some of you like i say i did find hearing other women's birthing experiences very useful um because i just feel like it it helps you feel a bit more confident going into birth about possibly what might to, what you might expect and yeah as i experienced it can go from naught to 100 in a matter of hours so yeah my full birth experience was about nine hours from start to finish that is a very very short uh, labour time especially for a first pregnancy and again that's all I'd heard people saying god I was in labour for 30 hours four days all this stuff and I was like oh god who's got time for that I was half considering a c-section purely for that reason I was like I don't have time to be in labour for three days oh that's what I was going to say my warning signs um which I didn't know were warning signs um so he came early as I say and there had been a few a couple of things that had happened um and again so for anyone that's due this might be useful. I had ha right, I don't really know what Braxton Hicks are. I I had them, I had the cramping of the stomach, yeah? So like a tightening and your stomach goes a funny shape your, of your bump. I'd had that and someone told me that was Braxton Hicks. Then one morning, about a week before I went into labor, I woke up and I, for about two hours, had really intense cramps, like honestly like labor pains, but these were in the bottom of my stomach. Pain so so painful, I had to breathe through them. And this lasted for like two hours. Um, and I remember texting my sister and my mum and they're like, oh, that's Braxton Hicks. But now I think that might have been early labor. <laughs> uh, I also had like a pinkish discharge um, about four days maybe before, the week before. And that is called effacement. And basically what that is, is your cervix thinning. And I know this because I googled it and I desperately tried to find people that had said that this had happened to them and then they'd gone into labour a month later because that's how long I had. No, not a month, but you know, three weeks to a month later. No, everyone that had this said, oh yeah, a week later I went into labour, two days later I was in labour. So I had read that and I, I just, in my head was like, no, that can't be what it is then. But then having gone into labour early, the week after this was happening, it that must have been what it was. So yeah, those are just a couple of things that happened to me. But now, like I say, I look back on it really fondly and I'm so grateful. I had all this attitude about an August baby because of the school year. And I, I'm actually so grateful he came in August. I'm so grateful he's a Leo boy. Um, I'm so grateful that for the experience I had. Um, oh, my after 
like postpartum actually I just want to touch on sorry I will stop talking soon because again everyone told me horror stories especially with episiotomy about the first wee and just your and the first poo and just the recovery in general um don't get me wrong it is uncomfortable I found disposable pants were much more comfortable than those fucking brick maternity pads that they give you yeah sitting on it quite painful breastfeeding um, and like shuffling around in bed quite painful but only for about a week or so and the first wee was absolutely fine I don't know if it was the position of my wound because again I'm not actually sure where it is yeah I don't know if it's where it was or anything like that but my 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 toilets following childbirth were no problem at all and I bought everything I bought those tucked things I bought that thick that bottle that you squeeze on you whilst you wee everything I had and I didn't need any of it apart from disposable pants and maternity pads for the bed I probably bled for maybe a week and a half like heavily well not even really heavily but you know to the point where I had to wear disposable underwear probably for a week or so two weeks maybe and then I just would wear normal sanitary pads and then I was fine and I mostly wouldn't bleed but if I walked anywhere I would and this I found this out because I thought I was healed um, and I went to Sainsbury's across the road and bled when I got back because it was just too far for me to walk but it's very easy to walk around your flat and feel like oh I could walk outside and then you get outside and you're like oh actually I probably shouldn't be walking the midwife actually on the second day she did comment on how well I was walking for someone that had an episiotomy so I don't know if it was just not a particularly big one whether the surgeon was just great at patching me up I'm not sure um but it wasn't particularly traumatic it, it I didn't have an awful recovery I do feel like I can kind of feel it still now like when I sit in a certain position I feel like maybe I can feel the scar or something I'm not sure um but you know it does take a while to recover after these things but overall my recovery was really not a, not a problem at all um it was breastfeeding that was the shitter um <laughs> but we'll go into that another day so yes I'm going to finish this video here because it's probably about 40 minutes long I definitely think I've included everything but if you guys have any questions or anything then just let me know other than that baby mum and dad are all doing very well really enjoying it really enjoying it like I love it I love being a mum I love having a boy I just love everything or maybe I should have said about giving birth in a pandemic because <laughs> I didn't even really touch on that but to me well I think I was in the gap where things were normal so Hainsey was allowed to be with me the whole time he couldn't stay over on the first night but he could stay until 10 p.m I didn't have to wear a face mask and I really wouldn't have known that there was a pandemic going on uh, but like I say I think I was in that window where everything was slightly more normal anyway right I'm gonna end this now thank you guys so much for watching and don't forget to subscribe if you're not and yeah if you want to see more of Gabriel head over to one of my vlogs and yeah I'll see you on the next one Mwah.